temperature. <laughs> Otherwise, it, the laptop would have shut down. Um, OK, we'll move on. Issue two then. So moving on to open space and sports provision, we'll talk about some of these issues. I know that people want to um, to go through them with these points. Um, so we're sort of making our way through the PM policies um, within the plan. So we'll start with um, policy PM3 then. So I just asked the council just very briefly, um, just run through what PM3 does. Um, and what the requirements are based on, please. Um, the MPPF uh, states that planning authorities should base their policies for open space and sports facilities on robust and up-to-date assessments of local needs, um, which should also identify specific needs and any quantitative or qualitative deficits or surpluses of open space, sports and recreational facilities in the area. Um, so this um, has been done through um, a assessment carried out by consultants like Kavanaugh and Page, um, KKP, um, as I call them for short, um, who undertook an assessment of the district's open space and um, outdoor sports facilities. Um, so that is published in um, essentially four different reports um, from 2019, which are uh, the main report on open space, um, which does the kind of quantitative qualitative assessment that I mentioned of the designated open space sites themselves is in PMEB 03A. Um, PMEB 03B then sets the um, quantity standards um, and recommends to do this as a standard in uh, amount of hectares of each open space typology per thousand of the population. Um, so that correlates with the table that you can see at part, well, table 6.3, uh, which is a part A of PM3. Um, then in terms of playing pitches, um, the assessment of kind of existing context, the facilities that the district has is in PMEB 04A um, and then the strategy and action plan, including recommendations for the plan period uh, is in PMEB 04B. Um, additionally, um, there was for indoor sports, um, the indoor sports facility strategy um, dated 2022, uh, which is PMEB 02. Um, which carries out a similar assessment and recommendations for outdoor sports. So we're just straying off PM3 into PM4 now. Um, but in terms of the evidence-based documents behind those policies, these are the same ones. Um, and so then we have the quantity standards, which I mentioned in PM3, um, at part A, table 6.3, and then at part B, table 6.4, um, we have for amenity green space and um, children and young people's provision, we have um, thres thresholds which set out um, what would be the expected minimum scale of development where those facilities would be expected to be provided on site. Um, so below those thresholds, they generally be expected to provide um, contributions via section 106 to um, existing facilities in the district, uh, which we assess on a case by case basis. So this is the requirements that relate to to new development and within your hearing statement, I think there was a further suggested change. This was to do with some of the background evidence and it says that the council intends to commence a formal review of the play and pitch strategy in 2024. Just, just talk to me a bit about where that's come from. And well, I know where it's come from. It's come from the Sport England's representations. But was there a position then that the council's evidence was was out of date? And just talk to us about why the council then didn't update it at that stage as part of the plan preparation, and why you said that you will update it, um, you know, following adoption of the plan. Um, so as you identified, yeah, the um, the commitment to commence a formal review to the play and pitch strategy in 2024 
um, kind of originated in a rep from Sport England um, where they haven't said that the existing evidence is out of date, um, but it's just been agreed through the statement of common ground with them. Um, also, they yeah, they said that it's not out of date and no change is needed to the um, local plan at present, um, but the evidence should be um, kind of brought up to date as, like soon after. So um, that's the agreed position in the statement of common ground with Sport England um, and hence the um, addition that we mentioned about um, intending to commence the review of the play and pitch strategy next year. Uh, so then, sorry, further in terms of your second oh. question, um, we then didn't update the evidence and because they hadn't concluded that it was out of date, essentially, that's the reason. Um, and the topic paper, um, that's the one bit of evidence that I didn't mention on this PMEB01 um, open space and sport topic paper um, introduces um, some kind of factual updates where we were aware that the situation had changed since the original evidence base assessment was carried out. Um, so that's fed into the plan that you see today as well. Just in terms of the modification then, obviously it's it's a sort of statement of of fact, really, isn't it? Just wondering two two sort of strands to it. A, is this something that the council is is definitely going to do? Um, but also B is is the plan on sound with without saying that really. Um that's the, the crux of it. I think what the soundest reason would be to sort of include that additional text at 6.59. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the council um, are, com are committed to that um, approach. We're already working with the um, open spaces team at the council. Uh, it's already been started to be looked at. Um, as Alex said, we already did start um, looking at some of that as part of the topic paper uh, in any event. Um, but yes, that is a firm commitment to commence that review. Obviously, the timing of some of um, these reviews, um, as I say, it's not we don't consider it out of data anyway, but obviously during COVID um, and, and some of the use of some facilities over the last few years, obviously, has been very different. So we actually think it'd be more appropriate to update now that things are getting back to normal, um, updating things like sports strategies um, during a time when people weren't able to use them, obviously, wouldn't have, wouldn't have been the best approach. Um, I I agree, I think possibly not a soundness issue, but um, it is a commitment to something the council is going to do. So we do we do think it is important to include it in there. Um, but possibly as an AM, maybe maybe it's not a main mod. I think I think if it stemmed from the statement of common ground with Sport England and provided the council does intend to do it then <clears throat> excuse me you could probably argue that it's necessary for effectiveness because it's signposting people to you know the fact i think it was the last one 2019 um that you know um this this document was 2019 you, you clearly didn't update it during sort of pandemic um because obviously yeah fewer people will be using those facilities um so i think i think it probably is something just just about that you know if the council wants wants to have that in the plan um then we could probably support that as as a as a main modification um and the justification for doing so would be that it reflects the current state of the evidence and in recognition that that evidence will be updated in due course um presumably any changes then would have to come through a review of policy pm um three if that did change anything um or if any requirements needed change in due course well the requirements of pm3 are more in relation to the, obviously the open space sports are covered more by pm4 um and this that was a play and pitch strategy um commitment to yeah, review that rather than open space strategy yeah. so um so yeah possibly possibly wouldn't affect pm3 uh, i don't think yeah. um 
and PM4 doesn't specifically list all of the requirements and recommendations that come out of it anyway. Uh, it's, all so in, it, it's all in supporting text. So PM4 then, what does PM4 require? Four um, is the requirement for contribution to all the sports facilities. So that's following on from the playing pitch strategy, local football facilities plan and the indoor sport strategy. Um, and it's highlighting the need of the um, use of the Sport England playing pitch calculator and the sports facility calculator. Yeah, you've already got all latest available evidence. I'm just thinking because because in PM4, sorry, you're, you're right, it is PM4, that that relates to the playing pitch strategy 2019. All latest available evidence, so presumably that allows scope then to to update that as required. Then doesn't it without you know formally reviewing your local plan? Okay, fine. Um, Ms. Wakeleave, comments on on this then. So this, these are requirements for new developments. Thank you kindly. Um, I. I'm listening very carefully and I'm appreciating what's on page 254 and um, the PM3 providing open space. I'm grateful to the table with the topology that um, Council have specified there. Um, local, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on how we can get the best options in SAP 1 the Whitfield Urban Extension. And um, I want to just provide by context the fact that local people have the experience of a large national housing developer on a development north of Deal who had planning conditions regarding planting of trees. And he put in hundreds of trees, about 200, um, and they all died um, because they weren't planted properly and because they weren't maintained or watered. So a second bunch of hundreds of trees went in and they died. This is an experience that people have locally. Um, so therefore, what I'm about to suggest as a main modification um, is about um, trying to prevent this happening, particularly in the light of um, an influential large national developer who I have heard has been able to shape a new master plan in the Whitfield Herbal Expansion. You know to whom I refer, and the first initial is P. I hope that will make things clear. So what I am, you know, we've discussed this carefully in the light of what our experience is down here, and some of this is about having the open space which is shaded because people are going to be suffering because we're about to overshoot 1.5 degrees um, climate change. We're on, on course at the moment for 2.4 or 3% climate change and that is going to affect people and make them need shaded um, open spaces. Um, in the summer and also of course um, the amenity values of trees is that the root system of mature mature trees causes them to absorb um, um, dramatic rainfall precipitation etc so therefore we feel that the tendency of large developers to do a complete clean sweep and fell everything in a large area is problematic because if we, um, if existing mature trees of a good size to cut, cut, capture carbon now, offer immunity value now, are replaced in urban expansion areas, and this is not only SAP1, it's SAP24 and SAP28 as well, by young saplings that will not be able to capture a similar amount of carbon, not be able to protect and offer shade for 40 to 50 years, not be able to absorb um, precipitation, rainfall, dramatic rainfalls for 40 to 50 years, then the plan will not be compatible with Environment Act 2021. It will not be compatible with um, the um, Climate Change Act of 2008. So therefore, what we're asking for, in order for the plan to become sound and legally compliant, we suggest that for every um, roughly 50 dwellings, um, you know, looking at about 
200 meters squared per dwelling, um, an open space of around uh, 150 meters squared and another woodland area of 150 meters squared should be provided and those allocations to be non-transferable um, and this development should only be permitted of if something like 80 percent of existing trees are retained because they are the ones who have got those amenity values now um, and in the life of these 20 years of the local plan whips won't get to that maturity um, so that's why we're suggesting that there should be a main mod to get the large developers to not just respect in the breach but actually in the reality um, the need to retain trees to provide those mature trees on the sites between where the houses are built so there's there's a that's that's what we're suggesting on that one. Um, the um, I'm, there's another factor I'll bring up, but that's not that's specifically on um, PM five and the protection of local green space. So I'll come back to that later because we're only focusing on PM three at the moment. If that's okay. I think in terms of trees specifically. Um, Obviously, the plans are as a whole, so other policies would apply. So, and again, council can jump in, but I think CC8 would apply, and that is a policy specifically around tree planting and protection. So, it's two parts of the policy. First is provision of new trees, um, and I think probably the relevant part there is um, it said a detailed landscaping and landscape management plan should be submitted for all major development schemes including details of trees and shrubs to be planted, proposals for how the landscaping scheme will be managed and maintained over the lifetime. So I think that's the, probably the first point about future management and maintenance. There's probably enough there for the council to, to sort of enforce against that. Um, and then the second point is around tree protection and replacement. So I think unless the council has anything further to add, I think, I think CC8 is probably quite robust in that regard. Thank you kindly. I've got it cross-referenced with CC8 as well. I agree with you. Um, it's a question of how many planning enforcement officers the council is able to employ in reality, um, which is outside the scope of the local plan, I realise. Um, but it's, it's about a determination to uphold these things and not let them just be um, activities where promises are traded. Yeah, this, this this is a sort of recurring theme that's that's cropped up on other days of the examination around. Um, you know, we we can talk about the policies. Um, it, like you said, it's it's out, outside the scope of the examination as to what you know people and and that could be anyone from individuals using the plan up to up to sort of large companies. You know, it we we we're not here to sort of speculate and say what people may or may not do. And we can only look at the local plan and the policies that are, that are before us. And I think CC8, um, you know, includes the necessary safeguards to, to cover these things in, in more than enough detail, really. Thank you kindly. I merely see this as one of my jobs to do reality yeah. checks here and there. Anything further from the council? Uh, nothing further, sir, no. Um, Moving on to PM5 there, so this is where we get into some of the um, sort of existing spaces, so open spaces and local green spaces. So we'll start with um, PM5 to begin with, and I'll just turn up the relevant uh, pages, just bear with me. So PM5 is protection of open space, sports facilities and local green space. Um, so first question again just just sort of by way of introduction to this topic it might just be helpful if the council just explains what does pm5 um actually relate to so what are the types of spaces that it relates to um whether or not they're shown on the policies map and how the council came to designate or identify these relevant spaces please Thank you. Yeah, the purpose of the policy um, is a, a one of protection. So it's 
it's uh, ensuring um, that there's no loss of um, some of these important functions, uh, open space, sports facilities, um, etc. Um, the open space obviously is very broad um, and can be defined in a number of ways. The justification for the approach um, at paragraph 6.70 does obviously quote what the definition is from the MPPF. Uh, and then we it goes on at 6.71 just to talk a little bit more about what the types of um, open space that could include. Um, parks, informal recreation, green space, natural and semi-natural green space, amenity green space, sports, etc. Um, it's also really important to know, obviously, most open spaces in some ways have probably more than one of those functions. Um, quite a lot of them obviously have, have crossovers, um, particularly sports and recreation and, and in in rural settlements, etc., probably more than one function. Um, with regards to how um, they've been identified, uh, most of them have been identified for um, in, in previous plans as well. Um, so as Alex um, referenced previously, the KKP reports, the Open Space Assessment reports, um, were where all of those were factored in an assessment of their um, their status was undertaken. Um, all of that information can be seen in that in that report. Um, they are all shown on the policies map where they are defined as open space um, at the moment in those KKP reports. The full list of them is appended to the open space topic paper as well as in the KKP reports. Um, and it's also made clear in the justification at 6.75 that even if they're not shown currently on the policies map, um, that obviously this it, it can apply to um, more than just those identified based on the definition from the MPPF. So we have set that out already. Um, with regards to the review that was done by KKP, as I say, they undertook a review of all of them. The changes that were made um, to boundaries were purely in relation to where some of those open spaces may have had some built form on them. Again, the open space topic paper does set out that um, that review of work that was done. Um, obviously, things do change, um, things move on, and some boundaries were amended, but that was purely to move, remove like built areas and things that had changed over time out of those designations. Okay, so let's take, so uh, we, we've got some questions around some of the sites, but we'll ju I'll just open it up first to obviously mindful there's some certainly some members of the public here today. Um, does anybody wish to speak about any of the um, council's list of open spaces we'll come on to local green spaces but just in terms of any of the open spaces that they've identified in particular um, Ms Wakeleave go to Ms Wakeleave first um, and then we'll, we'll we'll move on thank you kindly um, um, the list of uh, local green spaces, we do feel that one glaring omission um, from the list here is Betshanger Country Park, which was formerly Falmead. Um, this is um, to the east of the A258, uh, north of Deal. Um, the site was formerly publicly owned by um, CEDA Development um, Authority. It was designated by them as a local nature reserve. Um, it, that was applied for with DDC. The application somehow got lost, strange. Um, and the, uh, the the point is the current developer snapped it up when Hadlow went defunct, went bankrupt. Um, well, financial problems would be a better phrase. Um, so it's designated as low key, low impact recreation. We think this should be designated as a local nature reserve. We also think it should be designated a biodiversity opportunity area um, by DDC um, because it's rewilded, because it's mosaic um, habitat um, has been carefully uh, um, um, evaluated both by the RSPB and by CPRE Kent um, and the Kent Recorder. Um, so therefore, there is a lot of evidence of how this rewilded site um, 
is a, a biodiversity hotspot. Um, so this is why we suggest that this site must also be designated as local green space um, biodiversity opportunity area, local nature reserve. For the that that would that is a main modification in order to make the local plan sound and effective, in our opinion. Okay, so before we go on to, I think it's Mr. Hochstrasser, just, just the council's view on that then, in terms of how that's currently designated and shown on the policies map in the plan. Yeah, so Betts Hanger Country Park is included in the list of public open space, so it's protected by the policy on that basis. Um, and it, ha it has been for some time, so that's all, you'll find the detail of that all in the KKP report um, as well. Um, in relation to the local green space uh, designation, uh, this site was submitted at the Reg 19 stage uh, as a suggested site for local green space. Um, an assessment hasn't been undertaken of, there was two sites submitted for local green space, an assessment hasn't been undertaken of, of the local green spaces submitted at Reg 19. Um, but obviously I think most of these comments I think are in relation to some planning applications that were submitted prior to the Reg 19 consultation. Um, in 2022 that are still awaiting determination. So I, I wouldn't want to comment on the, the history or the planning applications at this time. It's not part, it's not allocated in the local plan other than being designated as public open space, so. Okay. Um, we'll go to, is it Mr. Hochstrasser, if I got the pronunciation of your name correct? Yeah, hi, good morning, hi. Yeah, my name is Pia Tokstrasser. Hi. Uh, you have my hearing statement, I, I suppose. So there's not that much I want to I want to ask I want to add to that. Uh, uh, I'm referring to the land called Off Mill Lane East Street, Site Ref 393. It has been decided to fall into the category of amenity green space, which is defined as, if I quote, opportunities for informal activities close to home or work or enhancements of the appearance of residential or other areas. Uh, I think there's a good argument that this definition does not apply to this site. Uh, for instance, we couldn't take our dog on this site uh, out of fear of injury because of the, the brambles and, and the rubble on site. Uh, I cannot really think of a meaningful act activity that can be performed on the site, not only because it is fenced in and not accessible, because of the of the snag heaps on it and, and the rubble on it. And I don't think it is an enhancement of appearance either, or mentioned uh, issues. It, uh, as I stated in the hearing statement, it has been defined. It's by the Texas Council themselves as very, very low, the lowest one from all the open spaces in that district. Uh, my wife and I, we have been trying to improve this site. She bought it 16 years ago. Uh, over, over the last three months, for instance, we, we employed three surgeons to cut down, well, to, sorry, to trim 47 Leilandi trees, uh, some of which have threatened to fall on neighbors' properties. It's there's like a, a black wall around the, around the site of not very sightly, Leilandi trees. Uh, we would love to fully regenerate the site, uh, getting rid of the slag heaps, uh, resurfacing, resurfacing the two access roads, huh? digging the rubble out, making a garden, a wildflower meadow. My wife is a horticulturalist. But to do this, we need to live on, on a daily basis on the site. Uh, hence, we, uh, we ask to remove the amenity green spice for this for this site or at least for a small section of the site uh, we think that will be a benefit to the community if we regenerate the site uh, to wildlife and to biodiversity the access road fixing those will be benefit to the immediate neighbors some of them uh, have access rights over them you know and also making a car park space available on our site for one of our neighbours will help to, uh, to ease the congestion on Mill Lane. Are there any questions you want to ask me? 
Okay, so look this up to the council then. So I just I'll just bring up the policies map actually to look at this. So this is a designation of amenity green space. Um, so just a question for the council. Can you just run me through then what the justification is for the inclusion of this designation in this particular parcel of land? Yes, yeah, so um, the site um, is referred to included in the KKP assessment of open space that we've discussed um, as within the open space, uh, amenity green space quantum. Um, it has been designated as open space since the 2002 uh, local plan. Um, Mr Hochstrasser correctly identified that in the open space assessment, it was one of the lowest scoring for quality and um, value score. Um, but in terms of the recommendations emerging from the KKP work um, around lower value sites, um, the premise there was not really to um, lose those sites essentially, it's to look at how um, ways they could be improved. Um, and in terms of PM5 um, protection of open space, uh, there's criteria in there um although we i think are suggesting a change to them as well just to make them mppf um compliant um there's criteria a and b but also a criterion c that's going to be added um which set out um circumstances under which whole or partial loss of open space um could be supported um so in terms of the um proposal that mr hochstrass was mentioning um, building a house on that land. Um, I refer you to the criteria within PM5, um, which are what the proposal would need to satisfy um, in order for the council to um, consider supporting that proposal. Um, I hope that clarifies. So just just in terms of this site, then, just talk me, just point me to the relevant documents where where the assessment's being carried out then. Where's best to look at the sort of um, it'll be position? The main open space report, which is PMEB 03A. Um, that's where the site is assessed um, with the quality and value score. Um, yeah. There's, um, there's a section in there. Um, it's done by grouped by typology in there um, in terms of the different sites. Um, so that site, which is named Off Mill Lane, um, that's what KKP named it. Um, yeah. Their site reference 393 uh, is included in the table of um, sites contributing towards the district's quantum of amenity green space. So is there anything within that document then that actually looks at some of the issues that um, that the participant has raised around its current use, you know, whether or not things have moved on since um, the previous local plan, any of those factors then? Uh, well, in terms of producing um, the KKP evidence and the strategic recommendations, um, they've undertaken a full review of the sites. Um, in terms of being designated, protected as amenity green space, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be publicly accessible land. Um, they can be um, sites which provide a, a visual amenity in kind of close proximity to um, residential dwellings. So, um, yeah, I think that's um, the extent of the, the KKP work. So where does where does that set out these issues? Then? So where, where is it set out that, you know, this is a particular site, it's viewed from A, B and C, X, Y and Z, and it's got a visual amenity to to the character of the village or the town or whatever. Where's where's that set out? Um, the report doesn't go into that level of detail. Um, it's essentially a um, quantitative, qualitative assessment of um sites with existing designations um and then just kind of reviewing um as carly mentioned previously where um particularly parts of school fields have been built on that kind of thing um it's where we change boundaries to remove those 
Um, so the level of detail in the KKP assessment is simply um, the quantitative and qualitative assessment of sites which had previously been protected. So we'll just talk me through what that means then. So in terms of the score, we can see, yeah, this is reference 393 off Mill Lane East Street. It's given a score of a quality score of 34.4 percent. So what 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 is that? Obviously, it's a it's a numerical score. How is that being calculated? Um, so the quality score, um, it's set out in the report. Um, I don't think I'll be able to list them all off the top of my head, but it takes into account a number of um, kind of criteria um, in terms of assessing all of the different open space sites. Um, so ancillary facilities, public access as a criteria, that type of thing, um, which derive the quality score um, and they set a benchmark of 40% in terms of where sites score under 40 percent um, that then feeds through into the strategic recommendations um, from the standards paper PMEB 03B um, where one of those recommendations is that the council should explore ways to improve the quality of um, sites which scored below 40 percent on the quality score um, and then the value score um, I think boils down to the typology um the kind of whether it's publicly accessible and the um number of users of that type of open space within um a catchment for it which is based on survey work they did to understand how far people are willing to travel to access the different typologies of open space um so that's where the value score comes from um albeit except where sites are not publicly accessible um, that's going to, um, I suppose, necessarily result in a lower value score, um, such as for this site, which I think scored quite low on value as well. Yeah, so here, so where, where you've got those sites that scored less than 40%, you said that they were then, remind me then, so that, that they were then sort of recommended to the council to sort of look at these, is that right? Um, yeah, so it then feeds through into the um, standards paper where at the end um, PMEB 03B to that document reference, um, mm -hmm. they make strategic recommendations, um, one of which is to explore ways to improve the quality of low scoring sites, um, okay. with the threshold for that low scoring being 40% or below. So what did the council do then with that sort of so they've gone away, they've looked at these sites, they've come up with these scores, they've said these score less than 40. So what then did you as a council do with that information and, and that evidence? Um, well, that then follows into the um, open space and sport topic paper, which, as I mentioned, um, was able to address um, some kind of factual updates where circumstances had um, kind of drastically changed on sites uh, where we've been made aware of them. Um, but as this site of Mill Lane had been counted as part of the amenity green space quantum, um, the recommendation from that report was to retain um, it as such. Um, and as I mentioned, an application on the site would simply need to meet the criteria um, in PM5. Um, So just just in, what what's that mean then in terms of open space quantum? Is it is it purely um, as it sort of says on the tin? Really, is it just about the amount of open space? What what's the sort of what's the rationale and what's the justification? Obviously, you know the, the participant have said you know set out in in the hearing statement there, overgrown, littered with debris, roof tiles, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, building rubble, an old builder's yard. So what benefits the quantum of open space does this site have? Well, I think Alex has probably covered the amount of um, detail we've gone into in that. We haven't visited every area of open space um, as well to then review. Um, some of the larger sites, um, you'll notice in the IDP of this particular projects and things they've come forward um, for enhancement, et cetera. 
um, with regards to these, particularly these amenity green spaces, um, they are often just pockets of um, green spaces, as Alex said, within settlements. Um, and the recommendation for this one was to retain it. Obviously, if the site status has changed since the KKP reports were done and it now does have a different status and um, on that evidence base, when the next um, review is done, um, obviously that will be looked at. Um, obviously, PM5 isn't a no development can come forward at all on here. So if enhancement obviously was part of any planning application coming forward and was going to improve that existing status, uh, the policy would obviously then uh, uh, support that approach. Um, it, it does talk about um, benefit to the community and in, in uh, criteria B in terms of the quality, quantity, accessibility of it, et cetera. So if the scheme was to come forward that met that criteria and enhanced enhanced that site that's obviously is shown at the moment just as it's a low value, um, then that would meet the policy requirement. Um, but, but yeah, no further assessment has been done specifically of all of those amenity green spaces across the district. Uh, Mr. Oxford, do you want to come back on any of those points that you've heard? Yeah, uh, it's about maintenance of the site. Like I think I mentioned that to the, the last three months, we employed a team of researchers, you know, to 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 trim 47 Lelandi trees uh, at our expense, of course, <laughs> uh, because they were of danger of falling over on neighbors' properties, and this is just half of the Leilandi trees on the site on there's only one area we, we did you know uh, so and the access roads needs constant maintenance it's it, we, we're running out of steam uh, if, if we don't actually have a chance to to to, ma to maintain the site it's, it's gonna deteriorate more and more we like to improve it okay um just in terms of obviously the same myself and Mr. Coyne do go and look at look at sites. Um is this one visible from public land or do we have to would we have to sort of enter privately owned land to sort of get an understanding of this? Yeah, site? you have to you have to enter it. It's not it's not publicly visible from, from anywhere really. Right, well, okay. except from the back gardens of some of some of the properties. Okay. I think what we'll have to do as with, with various sites, we'll, to, we'll go and have a look. Um, so what we'll do, um, I'm not sure if Louise is, is on the call, but Louise, the programme officer, we will um, make contact through the programme officer and we'll um, and we'll go and we'll go and have a look as we, as we will with, you know, sites we talked last week about housing sites and various things like that. We'll we'll go have a look. Um, so uh, you would have to, 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 to tell me so I I could be there with you to open the gates because it's locked. Yes, yes. So someone from the council would have to attend as as well. Yeah. Um, so it'd be myself or Mr. Coyne and somebody from from the local planning authority. Um, but um, the program officer Louise Injun House, she'll get in touch. Um, it'll be after Christmas, but we will come and have a look at some point. Um, and, and have a look at this. Fantastic. I am here, Inspector. I heard it all. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Newson. Oh, it's me actually. I just wanted right. to um, bring to your attention that um, I think it is in um, Mr. Hostracker's representation. There has been a refusal on the site for the dwelling and also an appeal decision um, where the inspector obviously has taken a view on that open space and the value of it as well. So it wasn't um, wasn't refused purely on its open space designation requirements and the inspector's report on that appeal uh, probably might be useful to read that context on their view on the open space and the visual amenity of the site. Do we have a copy of that? I don't think you do, but we'd be able to provide one. Yeah, yeah, if you could, we could have, we'll have a copy of that. Um, we'll look at that and then let's say, uh, yeah, if somebody, obviously Louise will get in touch in the new year, but obviously just Obviously, in the interest of fairness, just someone from the council would have to attend um, and accompany site visit as well, just in the same way as an, a sort of an appeal inspector would do. We'll, we'll go and have a look. Um, Ms. Waitley, Ms. Waitley, sorry, you've got your hand up. Um, 
just a brief um, request for clarification, if I may. Um, I'm hearing that the council, I'm coming back to the issue of uh, Bets Hanger Country Park, um, and I'm hearing that the council says that this was designated as local green space. I'm also looking at the page um, 261. I'm looking at 6.77 and 6.78 in the um, Reg 19 um, submission. And I, there's numbers next to a number of them, LGS, for example, W1 for Wingham Remembrance Garden. And I'm wondering, was one of those numbers allocated to the Betts Hanger Country Park? Um, if so, what is that number? Um, and um, while they, I've hear, heard assurances about um, Betts Hanger Country Park's designation as a local green space, I've not heard that um, they've seen fit to designate it um, as a biodiversity opportunity area, which um, I'd just like clarification on that, if I may. Yeah, do you want to come back on any of those points? Yeah, I'd just like to clarify, we have not designated Betts Hanger Country Park as local green space. Open space as a designation and local green space are two different categories of designation. So that's, the, I confirmed that the site is designated as public open space and is therefore included in the open space assessment reports, but the request to designate it as local green space specifically only came in at Regulation 19 stage and we have not made an assessment of the two sites that were submitted on that basis. So the site is not designated local green space um, at this time. Um, with regards to the other designations, you're mentioning biodiversity opportunity areas, nature reserve, etc. That's not something the council can do through the local plan. They're done by other bodies. Well, the clarification is appreciated. Um, obviously, there is a huge weight of evidence with the Kent Recorder, which would justify these designations and obviously I appreciate the fact that um, DDC has just had their green blue infrastructure um, consultation that's gone out. Um, would, would this lead to the sort of designations we're talking about in time for it to go into the local plan or not? Uh, we wouldn't be looking at any further designations as part of the local plan process just because of the stage we're at now. Obviously, we've already submitted the plan. Um, any future designations, though, if they were designated in future, the policies would still apply to them. So if a designation changes on a site during the plan period, then the relevant policy would apply. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, it goes right back to sort of day one, doesn't it? It's why the policies map isn't part of the development plan as such because things outside of that process change it um yeah you know conservation areas things like that um there was one other i want to ask a question on um and again just trying to read my scribbled notes um it was a representation that had come about open space 280 and i think this was a site in dover and i think it was plain view planning and to bit some reps on this and they obviously were seeking to change the plan to remove this one. So it's, it's something that we'll, we'll look at, but it said that it, it has planning permission for redevelopment. I'm not sure if you, if you know off the top oh, of your head which one that is. It's a reference to 80, the site reference. Yes. Um, so it's, yeah, land at um, the back of Newlands back in onto the A2. Um, yeah, as far as I know, it has a, um, out, it had an outline permission. Um, I think this is purely off the top of my head, I think for around 30 dwellings. Um, as I understood it, they had submitted a new outline for a higher capacity. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, in terms of the open space review, um, the kind of uh, on on the ground, the status hasn't changed of the site, and it was uh, in the KKP report as um, contributing towards the quantum of semi-natural green space. Um, 
So um, hence in the plan, it's been proposed to be retained. It might be helpful if you could just do a very, very quick um, note on that, um, just setting out what the current position is. Ha have a look at it. Obviously, if the site has come forward and, you know, I, I don't know the detail, I'm not going to form, but, you know, if, if an entire site was, you know, had a committed scheme to redevelop it for housing, then also there'd be, a, you know, there'd be a conflict between its continued designation as open space. It just goes back to that point about, you know, someone picking up the plan might not, might not realise what's going on, but have a look at it. Um, whether it's the whole site, I don't know, um, but it might just be worth having a look and just having a, a very, very brief update notice to the latest position. Yeah, that's fine. I think we think um, we have is, is one of the boundaries we have looked at. When I mentioned earlier that we did look at some of the boundaries and where there might be built form within them, um, we think it is one we have looked at the boundary on already, taking into account that consent. I think um, right. obviously some sometimes obviously it is it, it's more appropriate to change the boundaries once things have been built because obviously consents might not be implemented. Yeah, I think have, have a look. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll sort of have a look at this in a bit more detail as well. Let's say look on our site visits. But if we just have a quick note, setting out what that is. Um, there was also a um, suggested change through that representation. I think um, to look at, and this was about um, quality and quantity, really, in terms of local space and how you assess it. Um, which leads us on to the next question, which is around, is policy M5 consistent with national planning policy? And you did mention that you felt some changes were needed. Is that right? Oh, I think the council's screen is frozen. Is, is it they frozen on everyone else? Clive, can you see the council? They frozen. It, they're frozen on mine as well. Okay, Louise, could you maybe try and get in touch with them and just let them know that they've they're frozen in time. Yes, I will do. Okay, we'll just give it a minute or so. It might be they just need to yeah turn it off and turn it back on again. Standard IT solution. Oh, the back. You're back. I think the council's Wi-Fi just completely dropped out. Apologies for that. That's all right. I'll repeat the question then. We just moved on to sort of the the, the sort of wording of the policy then, um, and PM five, and I think you said that some changes um, were proposed. I think the same thing's happened again. Yeah, they're frozen again. I'll let them know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh. Are you back again? Back again. Yeah, we are. Sorry. No idea. That's all right. Okay. I think they've frozen mm. again. Shall we? I'll tell you what we'll do, Louise. We'll we'll take a five minute break um so if everyone just stays in the meeting we'll take a five minute break clive and i will all turn our cameras and microphones off if you just want to um maybe try and make contact with them if they need to reboot something or turn it off and on again or do whatever but we'll we'll, we'll take a break and we'll try and resume at 10 past 12 is that okay
Yeah, that's fine. And also, yeah. uh, Mrs. Sullivan, um, she has um, also had trouble uh, staying in the meeting. She hasn't been able to get back in it. I've sent her new links and I've sent her a line for the telephone, but neither have worked. So uh, there may just be a general problem with this particular meeting. Right. OK, well, we'll, we'll give it till um, we'll adjourn till 10 past and maybe if the council wants to sort of, yeah, just reboot things and make sure it all works and you can sort of test it with them. Um, we'll take an adjournment, then it will resume at 10 past. Hello, uh, Carly. Alex, it's Louise here. Uh, the inspectors have taken a, um, a break for um, yeah, okay, just for ten minutes, so you can re reset everything and uh, come back into the meeting. So they'll be back at um, ten past twelve.
OK, if you've got everything sorted. All right. Yeah, hopefully so. Um, apologies, the whole council building Wi-Fi went down, but hopefully we're I'm OK sorry? to carry on. Yeah, on. OK, we'll, we'll resume and continue then. So the question um, was um, policy PM5 then. So we looked at some of the types of open space. Looking at the policy itself then, um, I think you suggested that some changes might be needed. Yeah, firstly, we think we need to add um, a replication of um, what would be C in the MPPF paragraph 99. Um, which I think I think we've tried to do some kind of combination of the MPPF para 99 in B. So by looking at it now, it probably doesn't completely reflect criterion C of the MPPF. So we would suggest to add a criterion C here as well that um, repeats that criterion from the MPPF. Yeah, it's tricky with these sort of things, isn't it? Because you don't want to repeat national planning policy because that's what the MPPF tells us not to do. But equally, you know, you do need to make sure that you cover all all the relevant points. So I think you're right. I think I think probably have a look at PM5 and just make sure that the wording, <clears throat> again, with the ands and the ors and um, and the way in which it's set out um, and the main modification would just be to bring it in line um, with national planning policy already. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there was one further change that um, was in this statement of common ground with Sport England, which is ED23, um, and that was just the implementation section and paragraph 6.81. Um, we're referencing their um, certain evidence base um, and Sport England asked us to add a sentence which says, with regards to sports facilities, the council's playing pitch and indoor sport facility strategies will provide the assessment information required in the majority of cases. So they just wanted a, a clearer cross-reference um, to where users of the policy would be able to find what they would consider the most up-to-date information as a starting point. I Potentially not a soundness issue though, so um, we it could add effectiveness to the policy, but uh, we'll leave that for your for your decision. I think I, th I think probably it just strays into improving the plan rather than necessary for soundness on on that one. So I'm probably not necessary um, for soundness. Anything else on PM five? No. So I think I think you touched on it with um, was with Miss Wickley that the plan has different designations of different categories of open space. Obviously, there's the um, public open space, and then there's also local green spaces. Um, so just talk to us through that um, sort of quite important difference, really, and how the council allocated local green spaces then, and in particular, how we made sure that they were consistent with national planning policy. Yeah, thank you. So we, as part of the targeted call for sites, at uh, the Regulation 18 stage, we actually requested um, um, submissions for local green spaces from local communities. Um, obviously, it is a different, uh, quite new category of designation. Um, and gives an additional layer of protection to open space um, in that it protects it in the same way um, in the framework. Um, so we undertook an assessment. There was obviously guidance in the PPG in relation to how an assessment is undertaken for local green space. It obviously is the council's discretion and the PPG makes that clear. Um, and you can see our full assessment process of all of the submissions um, in a table at, in Appendix 3 of the Open Space Topic paper. 
Um, and once we undertook that assessment, you can see we then rated them uh, and determined which of those in, in that were submitted we considered were then appropriate, met all of that criteria and then could be designated through this policy and through this plan. And in terms of, are they all shown on the policies map? Yes, they are. They're not listed in the plan, are they? Or are they? Yeah, they're before. Uh, they're before the policy. They're yeah. listed. Six seventy-eight. Not in the policy. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, so they're listed at paragraph six point seven eight. Okay, so then, just in terms of. This final paragraph, sites identified on the policies map as local green space, including those identified within adopted neighbour plans or be protected from development costs to the requirements of national planning policy framework. Okay, fine. Um, I think it's a probably fine actually, just looking. So, local green spaces, because they show it on the policies map and your policy says the sites as identified on the policies map. I was just thinking whether or not they need to be in the policy themselves, but I don't think they need to be. Um, they're, they're within the sporting text and they're shown on the policies map, so I think that's probably um, that's probably fine. Yeah. yeah, that was our view, especially considering that um, that plans obviously might come forward and designate further sites. We thought it'd be more yeah. appropriate to leave it that way. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that's fine. Um, any comments or views on the local green spaces then, either supporting or objecting to them? Uh, Miss Wakeleaf? Um, thanks again. Um, just to come back on uh, what um, earlier discussions, um, is are either Carly or Alex able to um, confirm um, what um, that the um, Betts Hanger Country Park is part of the Lower Stour Wetland Biodiversity Opportunity Area as it's shown to be on the DDC map. Um, and the other, um, it's also listed under protected open space in the open space and sports topic paper of 2022, apparently number 388. Can you confirm that please? Paper appendix. Um, yeah, sorry, just took a moment there to have a look. Um, it's yeah, site 388 uh, in the open space and sport topic paper. Um, and part of the Lower Stour Wetland Biodiversity Opportunity Area. It's shown as such on um, the DDC map. Yeah, I think we just need to check that. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, we, we might have to we might have to follow up on that. Our internet is still not. That's fine. Understandable. Thank you. OK, thank you. We'll move on. Any other comments from any other participants on local green space or public open space? No. Nothing. OK, we'll move on to issue four now, which I think is the final issue for this morning's session around community facilities. Um, and again, so by way of introduction, um, this relates to policies SP2 and PM6. So this is all around the protection of uh, valued facilities and services, essentially. Um, and again, two, two sort of strands to this question. First is, is it consistent with national planning policy? And secondly, I think this is another one where you've suggested some some tweaks that a policy might be needed. So it might be just worthwhile you just going through those and just telling us why they're needed for soundness again. Thank you. Yeah, um, we do. So this policy obviously feeds on from SP2. So as 
overarching one. And then PM6 is the specific bit that picks up um, the issue of community facilities and services. The council obviously does see them as uh, being very important. So the policies into two sections of um, requirements for new. So major development obviously will need to look at provision of or enhancing facilities in the area that they're located. And then part two is in relation to um, loss of community facilities and services as well. Um, we do consider, I mean, our response sets this out. We do consider that the, the policies um, meet the requirements of paragraph 93. Um, it covers a range of different services. Um, the modification you mentioned was um, from based on a representation from KCC um, in relation to the use of shared um, facilities and services, and that would be made to the end of paragraph 6.8. Am I reading it right? Thing? No, part three, mem paragraph three of part one of the policy, sorry. Um, that we don't, we can. MPPF obviously already bring, mentions shared services in its wording anyway. Um, I think that's in part A of paragraph 93. It mentions the use of shared services. So we think that would just be an effectiveness point that the policy is reflecting MPPF and the supporting text that's already there. OK, so let's just look at the MPPF then. So which part of the MPPF did you say that I would reflect? Ah, oh, part A. Part A, paragraph 93. Sorry, yeah, part, yeah, part 93, part A, the first line, plan positive, the provision of use of shared spaces and community facilities, and then lists a number of things. Um, so I, I think obviously adding shared Okay. That approach. Okay, I think we'd be happy to support that because it does bring it in line with the MPPF. So that's um, a change for consistency with national planning policy. Um, the second part to that seeks to introduce the word exceptional. Why do you think that's necessary? Um. Reiterate that the council obviously is really keen to keep the services in. Um, particularly, I think we go on to mention as well in the supporting text, etc. Things like the settlement hierarchy um, that we've based the spatial strategy, etc. Have obviously been scored based on a number of services as well. Um, so we we do consider that um, exceptional circumstances is is probably the right wording. Um, we want to make it clear that we need to, you know, consider we need the evidence provided before we'd consider a loss of services, particularly in those rural areas. Um, the last paragraph obviously does go on as well, and that meets so 84D of the framework obviously specifically talks about um, services in the rural areas as well. So we think it would just add clarity on our position. I think the problem with that is when you introduce words like that, it goes above and beyond what the framework says. And also, whilst yes, it is very important, I don't think it's necessary for soundness because the policy refers to loss of existing community facilities. Um, and it says, permit mission will only be granted proposals involving a loss or change of use in the following circumstances. So. That's the test, isn't it? It's not. The, the, the test isn't one of exception. The test is one of do you meet the following criteria? Um, and that's what the framework says as well. So I, I take the point and I, I understand why you'd want to make that change, um, but I don't think it's necessary for soundness. And actually, I think it probably goes 
actually a bit above and beyond what national planning policy says. Um, and, and you don't need it either. You know, if a proposal failed to meet those criteria, it would just be refused against that policy. It'd be fairly straightforward, I think. So, um, so I think the first part of AM90, um, yes, but the second part probably not necessarily for soundness and could introduce sort of wording that goes above and beyond the framework. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. I accept that. Um, AM91, I think that was that just a typo? Yeah, that is just an AM. That's just a typo. Yeah. Yeah, like, so AM91 yeah. is is a is an additional mod. Um, there was a question with one of the reps around, and I think it was somebody raised this in one of the first weeks of the hearing around the protection of pubs. Um, so would this be the relevant policy then? Yeah, it would be. Yeah, so we do list. So if you go to the implementation section, paragraph 6.92, um, it lists all the types of um, facilities that are protected by this policy, and that includes under the so that fifth bullet point, cinemas and pubs. OK, any comments on this then? Again, so the criteria within the policy that just generally uh, generally reflects the framework and and just looking at the sporting text, is there anything within the sporting text that gives any further information on what you might expect applicants to provide? Yeah, that's all in the implementation section from 6.95. So we've yeah. been quite clear on the types of information we'd need to support applications. Obviously very different for, say, something in Dover Town as it would be for the rural area. Um, as I said, the, obviously the services in the rural area are of particular importance um, to us. Um, so there may be more requirements on those than there would be for, say, a town centre where there's already a variety of services. So uh, we consider that explains yeah. what we'd expect in those different circumstances. Um, just for the application of PM6, then, yeah, so the final paragraph says rural settlements. I mean, without stating the obvious, is that, are they set out anywhere? I know that, you, you know, it might sound obvious, but whether or not you'd get someone trying to argue that it was or wasn't a rural settlement. We could cross refer to SP4 maybe in the settlements we'd, that fall in the different centres, maybe local centres, villages, etc. That might work better. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's funny, you, you would get someone to, I think, trying to argue, you know, loss of the pub in this village, well, it's not a rural, rural settlement because it's near to Dover, for example, or something. So I think I think um, a tweak might be necessary for effective just there. Any comments from anybody on that particular policy? Then it's it's sort of fairly straightforward in what it seeks to do. Um, there's some pretty stringent tests within there in seeking to sort of prevent the loss of community facilities. No. Um, so they, if I could just come back on, sorry, um, you know, we, we're we looking up the point about the policies map raised by Miss Wakeleaf. Oh, yeah. Um, we've checked the actual Boa boundary and yeah, the Betsang Country Park is within it. Um, we do just need to check our own policies map because it doesn't seem to be flagging up on there. Um, yeah, the internet, but yeah, we need to check that. But um yeah it's within the actual bar um layer so okay any other questions comments or representations points that people wish to make on anything we've heard this morning nope clive anything from yourself that we've missed nope I've got nothing. Thank you. Now, Louise, anything from you that we've missed?
No, nothing. You seem to have covered everything. Yeah. OK, so as I said before, this afternoon is a separate session. So for those of you who are attending, I know Ms. Wakeley, I think you're attending this afternoon, so leave this meeting and then um, we'll we'll rejoin for this afternoon. And again, if you just want to rejoin, you know, 10 or 15 minutes before, just check your connection works. Um, we'll, we'll work from there. OK, thanks, everyone. We'll adjourn and we'll resume back at two o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye.